I'm gonna move around because I hate standing behind a podium. It makes me feel too professional and I don't like that too much. Um, how y'all doing? I'm gonna give y'all insight to how my life was for seven years in this city and, and what I had to deal with, like he said, on a, on a personal basis, living with diabetes. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was born and raised in North Mississippi small town, about as big as this auditorium. And um, my grandmother was type two, and she passed away from complications of, of diabetes. And the one thing about that is we never talked about it. I didn't know I was a, I didn't know that my grandmother was a diabetic until she was, she was in her sick bed. And we talked about it then, but not really. Really, my mom didn't tell me until actually I was in the hospital here. And for those of you kind of heard a little bit about my story, two and a half weeks before training camp, and I was just talking to the lady in the back about it, I lost 45 pounds in two and a half weeks. And this is getting ready for training camp, getting ready to go to Latrobe. Um, I was probably around about 325, maybe. 3.30 and got down to about 2.80 something. Looked like I was preparing for a, a basketball season. Everybody know John Norwig, the head trainer for the Steelers. He was, I walked in the, in the equipment room and the training room and he was, looked at me like, what is going on with you? That's, I could tell the look on his face. And I told him I didn't feel well and he sent me to Dr. Yates. I actually passed out on Dr. Yates' table. I drove 14 hours from Auburn, Alabama, up here, with my blood sugar over 550. And you know, and those cases of water, like come in like 12, 24 packs, I drunk two of those in like seven hours. And so I'm not gonna get too vulgar about it, but I couldn't stop, had my luggage and my dog and stuff in there, so really, a gallon jug was my bathroom. Y'all know how that is. <laughs> she laughed. <laughs> But you, but you understand where I'm coming from. Had to go to the bathroom every five minutes. And I'm trying to drive, and my vision's going in and out. So really, I didn't have a clue what was going on with my body, didn't, didn't know. I just turned 23 years old. So you know from maybe 25 down to like 10, you can't tell that age group anything. They all hard-headed, and I was in that stage too. So I felt bad, but I knew I had to get ready to come to training camp, so I was going regardless. That night I got here, you know, Dr. Yates came in and he said, well, let me get some blood from you and see what's going on. He came back probably 10 minutes later. He said, you got to go to the emergency room right now. I said, why? I think you're diabetic. I was like, what? I, I never heard that term. In the South, we call it sugar. That's, if he'd have said sugar, I might have known what he was talking about. But he said diabetic. I'm like, I don't, well, no, that can't be me. I don't know what that is. He said, well, regardless, you got to go. And I fought with him for a few minutes, and I ended up there. And by the time I checked in, I had lost, completely lost my sight, and my blood sugar was almost 1,000. And I'm downtown. So the guy told me, he said, well, you know, you're lucky that you wasn't a wide receiver or a running back because you probably would have went into a diabetic coma. You know, I was big enough, and my body was big enough to handle it. And the part far as being in the hospital, it wasn't a big deal to me because I've had surgeries before and it wasn't a big deal being in the hospital. The fact that I'm sitting there and I can't see anybody, that's the scariest part. I got doctors and nurses and trying to talk to me and poking me and stuff and, and trying to tell me what's going on. I, I want to see your face. I can't see your face, so I'm freaking out at this point. I'm laying in the hospital and I can't see a thing. My wife immediately jumped in the car and drove another. 13, 14 hours, and she was there. And the only way I knew she was there because I heard her voice. I couldn't see her. And at that point, we all in here, and I, I'm, for me, I try to be as real as a person and be a real diabetic, and I don't try to hold back anything. My thing at that point, I started questioning the man upstairs and asking him what's going on and what did I do? You know, why, why is this happening? I, I don't really know what's going on. and. At that point, you know, I didn't realize it. And like he said, 
I didn't want to be a diabetic. I didn't know what diabetes was, and I didn't want to deal with it at that time. I had just gotten to a, a point in my life where every young person wanted to be. You're playing for one of the best teams in the, in the country, and you love it. You've came off a successful season, and you don't want a hurdle in front of you. So why is this happening? I went through that whole year and basically shouldn't have played. And I remember my endocrinologist, and I don't know if any of y'all might know him, Dr. Ryle, if he's still down there at, at Falk Clinic. I remember him telling me, you need to come see me when you get out of here. Going back to being a hard-headed 23-year-old, I didn't. That whole season, I was barely 300 pounds, and my, probably every game my blood sugar was over 300. And I was struggling. I was getting thrown all over the place. That was one of the most frustrating things in the world to try to deal with is live up to the expectations of being a first round pick. You had a good season and now your body's failing you. And you know how the media can be. You try not to read into that stuff and listen to it, but at that point, it starts to get to you. So I'm mentally getting to it by dealing with diabetes and knowing that, okay, this guy's lost it. He might not ever recover. And so you start pressing even harder. And that was the hard part for me. And finally, I went to go see Dr. Ryle, and it took him probably a week or two, and I had picked it up just like that. I started understanding what diabetes was about, and going into my third season here, I was having the best training camp of anybody there. And those of you who know that, I blew my ACL out. Okay, you come to it again. What did I do? Okay, well, I mean, really, what's going on? And you really start questioning then, but there's a blessing that come along with that. Two days later, my oldest child was born. You don't look at it that way. The team went 15 and one, I had to sit there and watch them on TV, but I built a relationship with my daughter that I would never trade in for a 15 and one season or a Super Bowl season ever. The guys on the team, y'all know them, know their names, a lot of them got kids. They used to tell me all the time, you get to spend time with your children that we don't get. Take advantage of it. So that's how I looked at it. And that, that made a difference for me. Luckily, next season we won the Super Bowl. So that was another way of God telling me to be quiet. I got something for you. I got, you know what I mean? Had an opportunity to be able to experience something and everybody else on the team get to experience the same thing. I had to, got a chance to be a part of it. So I started realizing what was going on. I started getting more involved in the diabetes, diabetic community around here, doing stuff with, with kids and traveling around. And one of the hardest things for me to see with living with, with diabetes is the stigma that comes along with it, especially being an athlete. Children, for one, I have a thing about kids, especially ones that are diabetics. I'm a big kid myself. I like playing and having fun with people. And when kids get mistreated because of their diabetes, you know, and, and coaches in general or teachers, anybody don't give them time to test their blood sugars because they're so-called holding up their time, that bothers me. I've had instances where I've had to say some stuff that people might not like too much, but I tell them, I'm like, okay, there are a lot of different illnesses in this world, but what if your child was a diabetic and somebody, teacher, coach, doesn't give your child the time of day to do the things they need to do to get through that daily life? You would be pissed. So at that point in time, two, three hours, however long it is, you're that child's parent. Give them an opportunity to do what they need to do to prepare for whatever's going on on the field. That could be your best athlete, but you ain't give them no time at all. That's the way I look at it. And the way diabetes is, is going, everybody knows the numbers keep going up every year. And the way I try to explain it to the coaches or teachers, you're going to, once you lose that diabetic child, you're going to probably get, replace it with two more, the way things are going now. But that's education for you that you'll learn and you'll know how to deal with it when the time comes. So I have a, a passion for this that goes way beyond uh, what football's kind of ever given me. I look at it as being here and playing for the Steelers and being an NFL player has set the platform for me to be able to stand up here and talk to people like you and to give kids, even you guys, a chance to understand that 
It is what it is. And I tell people all the time that being a diabetic is all about loving yourself. Do you love yourself or not? I don't, I got three little girls and I don't want them to have to take care of me later on in life because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And if you don't go see your doctor, you don't take your medicine, you're affecting everybody around you, not just yourself. Because at some point, the people who love you are going to have to take care of you. Don't put that on them just yet, unless you just don't have any other choice. I'm going to give you one guy, and, and I know he don't mind me telling this story. Aaron Smith, to me, is probably the most underrated defensive lineman in the NFL and one of the nicest people I've ever been around in my entire life. He took me under his wing for one when I first got here and he didn't treat me like a defensive player did. He taught me so much on how to play this game. He whooped me on a consistent basis for my first two years every day and I had to like it. <laughs> <laughs> but he taught me how to play the game. And he would take me aside after every practice, say, okay, well, you can't do this. You showing me what you're going to do. You got to change it up. And me and him started having battles after that. I got better because of him. But that wasn't just because on the football field. Aaron's dad was a diabetic. Aaron's dad let himself die. He had medicine in the refrigerator, had all the supplies we all have, well, for most of us have, and he didn't use them. And for him to take me kind of under his wing and see that and said, okay, when you don't feel good, you need to get out of the drill. Go take care of yourself. I like to play and y'all see I'm kind of cracking jokes and stuff. That's my personality. I, I, that's just me. If I wasn't doing that with him, even when we in our stance or on a consistent basis, he knew I didn't feel right. He would make me get out or say, hey, call a trainer for me or something. And doing that, that made me more comfortable with being a diabetic. And I knew that my peers actually cared about me. And for most of us, we don't feel like people understand. There's been so many nights I've been downtown at Ruth, Chris, any of the other restaurants down at Palomino and trying to test my blood sugar, but I'm hiding. The first couple years, I would get up and go to the bathroom. I wouldn't let people see me taking my shot. And it got to the point where my wife got sick of me doing that. She's like, it's part of your life now. It is what it is. You got to be comfortable with it yourself. So sit here and don't get up. If the people don't accept it at a with us, then they don't need to be sitting here eating with us. Let them learn about it. And now, it ain't no big deal to me. I can sit here right now in front of y'all and test my blood sugar, put my sight in for my pump, anything, and keep talking. I don't have a problem with it. But we all have to be comfortable with it. It's part of our life. And when we're doing something and you're here today for a reason to try to learn more about it and take care of yourself. And it's, it's one of those things where during the season, I had a hard time on the field. Those of you that your blood sugar is kind of like mine sometimes, it's like this. And I mean, it'd be games where I'd take three or four shots during a game because I'm running high. And I didn't know, and I just found this out, and I've been, this is my second year being retired, that adrenaline runs your blood sugar up. So those Raven games. <laughs> <laughs> Those Cleveland Brown games, you know, I'm fired up, everybody out there cussing at each other and stuff, and I'm, I'm running over to John, and I'm like 275, 350, and I'm like, what is going on? I wish I'd have known that four, five, six years ago. You know, I, didn't, I just found this out within the last four, five months that adrenaline runs your blood sugars up. It's things that I've learned from doing this job and being around people like you and talking that I get to pass along to other people, especially kids that are dealing with sports. I've talked to parents who have the same issue. Why is my child running high during an activity? I tell them now, okay, now you got to try to find a way to combat it. I take a shot and then I drop 15, 20 minutes later. I'm over there shaking like a leaf. And people know the position I play, offensive line. I can't tap my helmet and come out of the game and say, hey, I'm low or I'm high. I had to wait till I get on the sideline to adjust my blood sugar. So as many times y'all saw us play when I was here, ain't no telling where I was. I was probably high and dragging or sitting in the huddle and just shaking like a leaf because I can't come off the field like Hines and everybody else can and fix themselves. So there's been many games where I've come off and checked my blood sugar and it's been 35 or almost 400. Yeah. I mean, that's what I lived with for the seven years I was here. 
And it was just part of my life. But it's something that I tell people, diabetes taught me more discipline than football ever had. Because it taught me what I could deal with mentally and physically. How far I could push my body. You don't want to push yourself that, uh, that far unless you just have to. And I was in a position where I had to, you know? And, and I learned a lot from it. I really enjoyed what I was doing. But now I get the opportunity, like I said, to get to talk to people and, and help them out and inform them on things that most people have never got a chance to experience. And I, I like talking just to individuals on the, and what they go through, because maybe it's something that I'm happening with me as far as my diabetes that I can't ask a doctor. You get from real people with real experiences, and I think you learn more from it than getting a, the clinical definition of it. That's the way I look at it. Talk to me about being a diabetic. I hate being a diabetic at least once a month. I'm being for real. Well, some people it might be more. Sometimes it's a couple of months for me, a couple times a month. I want to be able to go out and go to Brewster's, go to wherever it is, Cheesecake Factory, and have me two or three pieces of that cheesecake that you walk in the front door and you see, and knowing I'm not going to be 500 in one, within like 30 minutes. That's just me. That's my personality. I'm, I love sweets. And I fight with that all the time. But I, I'm like everybody else. I'm human. I have times where I cheat, and I know I'm going to pay for it within two hours. They say check your blood sugar every two hours after you eat. I wait about four hours. Just because <laughs> I know within that two-hour time frame, it ain't going to be good. <laughs> but, I mean, that's every night, every blue moon I do that. I'm just, I'm not a saint. I ain't perfect at it. I try to be, but I have times where I'm like, man, forget this. I'm home. I want that piece of cake. I want to go to P.F. Chang's and get that great wall of chocolate and enjoy myself. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you look like you're in good shape. Do you work out every day? I, I've been doing, this has really been taking a lot of my time up, but for the most part, I try to do something every day I get a chance to. I still don't lift like I used to when I was playing because I don't have no need for it anymore. But, yeah, I try to, I used to hate doing ad work and stuff, but I do more of that now even when I'm in the hotels and try to keep this area down. And I know I got to do it for my diabetes anyway to help keep my numbers down. But I still run and do stuff every now and then just to kind of stay fit. I don't want to be like the typical offensive lineman that when they leave, they gain another 50 pounds or 100 pounds. That's just not me. I don't want to be that way. My health, for my health, I can't do it either way. What do you I'm right at 296. And when I was playing here, I was probably between my last few years, 305, 310, maybe a little heavier than that. But I'm trying to, if I can't do anything, stay below 300 and go lower, that's what I try to do. But just to, to end on that note, I'm on, I'm on, He's asking questions. I'm going to give everybody a chance to ask me whatever they want to because I'm going to give you an honest answer to it. So anybody got questions, please ask me. Yes, sir. You were drafted number one in 2002, mm -hmm. 16th draft choice, and you were diagnosed right after your first year. And you played six more years, which is unbelievable. Uh, did you have any special dietary restrictions or, or – uh, How'd you handle the training table? Did they take care of you that way, or how'd that work out? Um, the question you asked was, my, was how was my diet when I was playing after I got diagnosed? The one thing I can give the Steelers credit for, they took amazing care of me. With my medicines, I didn't have to bring anything to work. They had it in the refrigerator that worked for me. All my shots, anytime I ran out, I could tell Ryan Grove, hey, I'm low on my insulin. I'm low on my background insulin. I need my metformin, whatever it is. They'd have it in there by the time I got ready to leave work. Every trainer that y'all see on the sideline with the fanny packs on, all of them had my glucose tabs in it, the gels, my insulin needle. At least one or two of them had a meter on them. So all I had to do was just raise my hand or yell at them. They knew I didn't want Gatorade. They knew what I needed. Bring me my insulin or my checker, one of the two. And most of them, I said, don't let your fanny pack run out of gels because I'm going to need them. Because most of the time I was up here and then I was down here. So I'm getting them and squeezing them and sucking them in at the same time. The one thing I didn't do was like normal players drink Gatorade. Y'all know to me that's taking them sugar water. For a diabetic, that's like killer. It ain't good for you. So I took, they took Crystal Light for me. 
and put those Gatorade salt packs in it and shook it up so on the sideline I had a Gatorade bottle with tape around it and had my name on it so everybody knew not to touch that. That was mine. It was tasted terrible. But, <laughs> but, for the, but I needed the salt and stuff to keep from cramping up. So that's what I used. That, that, was my, that was my deal. And even during the game, it's not the most sanitary thing in the world. Everybody know you, you want to try your best to rub your spot with alcohol swab. We could come right off the field and I know I'm high and I could check it. I ain't got time to pull my jersey up and stuff. I'm taking a long needle and stabbing myself through my jersey and taking a shot. I don't have time to pull the jersey out, rub myself down. There's been times where I've come off and checked and it's been 350 and Troy pick a pass off. And I've just sat down for two plays, and I got enough time to push that insulin pin and give it back to the trainer and run back out on the field. I've, that's happened a bunch of times. You know, it's happened times where I've been extremely low, and they get a turnover, and I'm still shaking as I run back out on the field. So, yes, sir. I remember you being an accomplished A&R artist. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I actually just did a um, charity piece for everybody who heard about the tornadoes down there. Um, the head coach's wife actually went and went all over Lake Martin and in the, the Alabama area picking up what they call trash, people's doors, windows, and had all the artists around the area take a piece and paint it. And they call it trash for treasure. And if you want to, if somebody want a piece of mine, it's on Facebook. Trash for Treasure, all in for U-Turn.com. You can bid on it online. And I did a big window, probably like this big, and painted on it. So I do more now. I used to do a lot of drawing in training camp. That was the only time I could do it during the season, just was too tired and didn't have time. So I still do it now. I, I love doing it. I absolutely love it. And it's something I love to do. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing is good is they got those they call um, accelerate goo okay. it's, it's, it's got like 25 grams of, of carbs in it but then it keeps you up energy wise and you don't have to have worry about it going through your system quick it, it won't go in and all of a sudden you drop it kind of takes its time getting through all that stuff they call goo okay. it's like eating tar but it's good though yeah, yeah. Yeah, acceler accelerate gel. You, you can go to like the bottom of the shop down here on McKnight Road, I know they got it. You can check it out. And another thing I, I use is to me has been like the best thing because I really didn't like the gels as much is um, they got the glucose shots now. They come in like the five hour energy bottle. That's like my favorite. I hate those, those chalky tabs. You feel like you've been chewing on a chalk stick for like three days. Oh. But, <laughs> I give me a Sprite or some cranberry juice before I eat one of them things. I hate those things. So, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, my husband's also a diabetic, and he's just already from two years ago. Um, the things that you take football class through CCA sits there, mm -hmm. um, and um, the Woodruff, what is it called? It's the Stiller office, and the one of our classes, we sent out, they sent out Stephen Henry. Mm -hmm. You know what, um, I, honestly, I, you know what, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't personally know Keevan, and I've heard a lot about him, but I don't know. Really? Yeah, I don't know much about him at all. Okay. Mm hmm Yes, ma'am. Um, she asked, was I angry about being diagnosed as a, as a diabetic and things were going on? Yes, extremely. How long did it take you to get over that? About two, three years, at least, because I feel like it interrupted everything that I wanted to do, that I was trying to do. And I always had restrictions on stuff that I always had to take the extra steps. Training, I had, and at that point, you have these flex pins now. I had the vial of syringe and syringes. So my wife was pissed at me because I was taking over her purse. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm being for real. <laughs> I'm just being for real. You know, 
I, I had, I was, I'm already absent-minded as it is. If I don't have a sticky note on my head, I'm gonna forget about it. So I, I was, I would mess insulin up. You know you can't let it get too hot or it breaks down and it doesn't work. I've had vials where I've dropped on the floor and been on vacation. And we trying to find a CVS and calling, you know, and having a hard time with that. And at one point I was on a sliding scale. So I was really angry because I was always chasing my meals. I'd take a shot for the food I just ate, not what I was about to eat. So you 300, you take a shot, I'm gonna get this down, and you come back and check again, and you 430. And I'm like, what is going on here? Why, why is this happening? And then finally, when I went to go see Dr. Rao, that's when they put me on the carb count. And it seemed like my whole life flipped over, and it changed when I started doing the carb count ratio. And it just made a difference. It, it really did. But for at least two years, at least two years after being diagnosed, once my body got used to it, I was still just upset about it because I couldn't train like everybody else. I felt different. Anytime, and Dr. Rao told me, he said, if your blood sugars get over 180 as an athlete, it's like you being out there trying to play with one arm tied behind your back. So when you're telling me, when I'm telling you about my blood sugars being over 250 and 300, think about trying to block Casey Hampton and Haloti Nada that weigh both weigh 360 and your blood sugars is at 250. And you know you don't have half your strength. So that was mentally, I was like, I'm already know I'm at a disadvantage. I gotta work harder because my body isn't working like it's supposed to. So when I'm out there playing, there wasn't nothing I could do about it. I could control it more during the off season because the workouts were strenuous, but it wasn't as hard as a game. So I could keep my numbers tighter and I could get more out of my workouts. But when it came to the season, it was all just me, a mental challenge. What can I get through and how far can I push myself? And I, yeah, the whole time. So I was just upset about it for the most part because I felt like I was at a disadvantage over everybody else. And if I knew I was high, I could feel it because I felt sluggish. And I just knew that, okay, you can't be out here against Cleveland and Baltimore and feel like your feet are in quicksand. You don't, have, you don't need to have that option. So. Out of curiosity, how, uh, how are the kids that you talk to? I mean, if you look around this audience, we're all old farts. <laughs> 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 He's the oldest one, so I'm okay. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, my, my one thought when I came in here was, boy, we need to get at the kids about this thing because the problem is the kids, and as you said, the, the fact that one now means two in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, um, I went down to Orlando this year for Novo and worked children with diabetes. You got 18 month old kids all the way up to 19 year old kids, all type one diabetics. Could you imagine an 18 month old little girl or boy walking around with an insulin pump on? Oh, I can 1,500 to 2,000 kids, every last one of them type one. And probably three, 400 of them are one to four years old, all with insulin pumps on. You talking about a life changing experience and it gives you, it, being around kids for one minute anyway, give me energy. But then you see a, a diabetic child, and you know how kids are. They handle stuff 10 times better than what we do as adults. And they run around in a swimming pool with Omnipods on and all kind of stuff. And it's like no big deal to them. But I'm going to tell you where the issue comes in at. From the age of 13 to 19, kids can be mean. And as children, we all have groups. I mean, kids, they have groups. They get into cliques and all that kind of stuff. There were so many kids there that I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with that they felt like they were absolutely alone because the other kids in the school were treating them bad, looking at them funny, you know, the diabetic kid, you know, and they didn't have anybody else. They might have been the only diabetic child in the whole school, but they felt like they were doing this by themselves. And so that conversation of me accepting it for what it was, I really had to go into it with them. And I tried to tell them, being a diabetic or any illness that you got can suppress your personality. And that ain't what God wants you to do. He wants you to be who he made you to be. Don't let that stop you from being what you want to do. Find that one person. If that's your only best friend, teach them everything you can tell them about diabetes. And that way, they're going to have whatever outside friends they're going to have is going to kind of slowly come into the group. Then you're going to become part of the group. It won't be just the two of y'all anymore. 
And that's why I had to explain it to them. It was so many kids there that just were kind of balled up and they didn't know how to express themselves. You could tell it. And they were better when they were around other diabetic kids, but when they got off kind of to themselves and we were talking, you see stuff coming out. And I was like, man, I lived it, believe me. I, I, yeah, I'm 32, about to be 33 now, but I still have times where I'm a little skittish about, you know, my diabetes, and, and, and especially if I don't feel right, and if somebody really don't know me, but I'm, I've really accepted it, but I still have times where I don't. So I try to let them know that you gotta find somebody and find a support group. Any person you can find that accepts you for that. It's, it's, it's a really, it's a lot worse with kids than what we think it is. I experienced that just from being down there. It's definitely life changing just to see how they interact and what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis, so. Mm -hmm. I, I think the issue is we need to get to the kids that don't have it. Right? You got a, Sooner or later, they're going to end up with it. You got a point. And you know what, though? With that, I've tried that, too, and talked to the, the, the ones that are borderline on that line. If they don't, tomorrow morning when they wake up, they might be. You, it's not getting through to the kid. It's the parent because it's a lifestyle change. But people think you got to completely flip your pantry inside out and dump everything out your house to slowly make little steps, and it makes a difference. Do it for your child. Even if you're not worried about yourself, they the ones are going to have the problem later on. You might have lived your life completely, but give them a chance to completely live their life and help them out. And that's the way I see it. I try to tell them that some don't accept it. You can kind of look at the looks that they get you, but you can still have your, your cake every now and then. You know, but don't have it every day. I find you one day a week, okay, this is going to be my cheat day or my pig out day. I'm going to go completely blow my blood sugar here on this one. And after that, you need to do it the right way. But if you don't, your child for one is going to be too heavy. You're putting them getting picked on. You're putting them for another thing, being a diabetic and feeling alone. And then, okay, if you're gone, then who's really going to support them and help them? So set them up right now, start doing the right thing, and then you'll help them out in the long run. And so that's what I try to tell them. And I do that even with my own daughters. I, I, I'm, I'll tell you, I don't want to lie to you, I'm, I'm a snackaholic. I walk and eat all day long. That's my problem. I fight that all day. I just, I'm be real with you, I do. I don't really, I don't eat big meals. I just walk by the refrigerator and grab something. Close the door, go do something. My daughter's fighting. I break them up, walk right back by the refrigerator, grab something else again. That's me. That's how that's, I'm just being honest. So I have to break that habit. I'm trying my best to. So if I do, I buy peanuts, like those mixed nuts and stuff, stuff that I know they ain't going to run my blood sugar up. I don't mind grabbing a couple, a handful of pecans or something. I can do that and don't feel guilty about it. You can't grab them with little packs of M&Ms. I hate Halloween time. <laughs> my kids love it. I hate it. Can't stand Christmas. I hate school parties. Birthday party where your little kids, all of them bring home five, five back. Oh, that's just the worst for me. Because <laughs> that's like kryptonite to me. It really is. One more question in the back. I saw you raise your hand up. Are you on the pump now? Yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. I, I, the whole time I was here, I took manual shots. I was taking up to eight shots a day. How long have you been on the pump? Just about a, about a year. And do you find everything is easy? It's, it's lev leveled everything out for me. So much better. So much better for me. I, I was so against it at first that I was just like, okay, I got something attached to me. I have something else I got to worry about trying to keep. And, but you don't realize how much more convenient it is. It makes your life simpler, and you will see your numbers just instead of doing this number, they level out. And if I screw up something, like I said, it's my, my snacking part where my numbers get screwed up, or if I just over bowl it. So my thing is if you're doing something with your daughters, or your kids, and I mess up and don't eat after I have bolus for my meal and wait too long, and then I drop. That's on me. But other than that, I'm like this. The whole time it's still like this. So if it's, you want to do it's a benefit, I would suggest anybody do it. And are your A1C numbers, are they good? Yeah. The last time I had my A1C checked, I was 6.3. So I saw, yes, ma'am. Yes, that my, my guy one, my middle daughter, she's four. She loves blood. <laughs> Y'all laughing? 
But if she see me reach for that meter, ooh, then let me see the blood. That's what she don't could care less how I feel. All she want to see is the blood. And she said to me before, Daddy, that ain't enough. Put, let me see some more. I'm like, get out of here. And she's four now. So she going to have issues. She don't, she don't care about She ain't them gory movies ain't going to bother her at all. So I know, right? Yeah. When I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with type one and a half. I was one and a half. And here within the last year, I'm completely one now. My pancreas has completely shut down. So that's a whole nother emotional roller coaster that I had to deal with. Because when I, when, I, when I retired, when I left here and went to New England and I went to Buffalo and I said, okay, this is it, I'm done. I said, okay, well, at some point I can maybe lose a little weight, whatever. I, hopefully I can just get on taking pills and not be taking shots. And I went to my new endocrinologist and he ran some blood work and came back with them, some more news. And he's like, well, I know you probably want to hear this, but you type one instead of one and a half, what they told you. And I probably sat there for about 20 minutes and didn't say nothing. So, but it's just, it's been something else I've had to deal with. Okay, well, I'm going to be on insulin for the rest of my life until we find a cure for it. So, yep. That's me. Thank you, I'm sorry. That's all right. Thank y'all. I appreciate it.